All right, wonderful. It's Friday morning and uh, we're here, we're gonna talk about uh, first aid for bug bites and rashes. Um, a little bit about prevention. I mean, we could go a lot more in depth about prevention that we're going to today. But um, I just wanted to say thank you to Barbara because she recommended this uh, or she, she suggested this class and, and requested this class. And just, um, you know, if anybody has a topic that they'd like me to cover, we absolutely can do that. And it's kind of fun for me to get um, suggestions from, from people because uh, it makes me kind of, you know, dig into a topic or, or, you know, sort of write about a topic that I might not be thinking about every day. And every time I do that, I find, I find, I, I like remember things that I used to suggest that I no longer really think to suggest anymore. Um, so, so rashes and bug bites. So first we're going to start with kind of a little bit of prevention because, you know, as an naturopathic doctor, that's where I always want to start is with prevention, prevention. Um, so, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of bug bites there, I wrote on the top of this, this handout here, eat more garlic. Um, and then actually did a little bit of digging about that. Cause I knew it was controversial, um, that, you know, maybe that doesn't really work. And actually there is, it, unfortunately it doesn't really work. Um, I think I just love saying eat more garlic cause there's so many re good reasons to eat more garlic. <laughs> so it's a like, yeah, one more. <laughs> it's a little like, um, and, uh, so, um, so they, they did a placebo control trial where they had people take garlic pills and other people take placebo pills and they both got the same amount of, of mosquito bites. Um, so, you know, that, um, it seems like maybe that doesn't pan out. Um, so, but, but for a lot of reasons, it's still good to eat more garlic. And, um, one of the things that really, you know, bugs are, especially mosquitoes in particular are looking for is, um, carbon dioxide. So the more, the higher a person's metabolism, um, the more carbon dioxide they, they're breathing out, the more they get, um, uh, more bug bites they'll get because that, that's really how they find, they find mammals in the environment is to, I guess, and, and amphibians and um, <laughs> living creatures <laughs> is by finding the carbon dioxide that they're exhaling. Um, so there is, there is something to be said for that. Um, another thing is really that you know, in areas where there isn't a lot of air movement, um, obviously the bugs are going to be a lot worse, especially the mosquitoes. And it's interesting that like, the World Health Organization really considered uh, mosquitoes to be the deadliest animal. And that, like, really, you know, I read that, I was like, oh, wow, right, yes, because literally because of the vector that they are and the, the diseases that they carry. Um, there was a case of West Nile virus um, recently in Connecticut, you know, I mean, that you know, these more those a lot of the, the diseases that mosquitoes carry don't affect people in Connecticut as much um and also mosquitoes um do uh do carry lots of things so the, so the more we can prevent bug bites the better off we are um some plants that you can have around place, spaces where you like to be whether it's like a little if you have like a little outdoor seating area or where you like to be um catnip lavender marigold Ooh, I spelled marigold wrong oops <laughs> citronella <laughs> um so you can actually plant you know a lot of people are familiar with like the citronella candles and citronella oil but you can actually plant citronella plants um I actually did not look into whether or not those are invasive or you know uh native or anything like that so so maybe do do the homework on that but the uh but the the candles themselves a lot of times are petroleum based type of a thing and so you know they're they're okay they work well but um even better to use the, the citronella oil. Um, if you're gonna, if you, you know, plants are great and then, then the oils are really good too. Um, you can use them as a spray, which we'll talk about at the very end. Um, the um, uh, citronella is a great one for, uh, for mosquitoes and also the lemon eucalyptus is the other one that's been tested and, and really effective against mosquitoes. Um, the, the, I didn't go as far into tick bites because that's kind of a whole other class really. Um, the, um, but the, the oils that are most effective against tick bites are geranium and grapefruit actually. So <laughs> they do, wow. I went back and looked at all the, the primary data on that. And um, there are people out there in the world that like their job is actually to to look at ticks and watch them move. Uh, and so, so they like put like something in one area and then they see whether the ticks move away from it or towards it. And, um, and geranium and grapefruit were, were the two that, that the ticks moved away from the most. Um, so it's, it's a, 
uh, pretty wild to think about counting counting ticks. Um, and I'm really grateful for the person who does that out there in the world. <laughs> they don't know. Now, can, can you put that on your skin directly, the geranium and the? Um, it's good to put it into a carrier oil, um, or you know, mix it in with your sunscreen or something like that, because. Um, the, uh, it's, you know, if you put it on any, any essential oil directly on your skin can be irritating. Um, so I have it written kind of as like a spray that you can use, but you can also, you know, some people just put it in a little bit of like, um, uh, like the, the liquefied coconut oil or the olive oil or something like that. And then just put it on. Yeah. Um, the, you know, um, full, full coverage clothing is not only good for sun protection. It's also really good for bug protection as well. Um, there are some, uh, clothing options out there that are embedded with permethrin um, that that have even more bug protection. Um, permethrin of the of the different you know sort of uh, things that are out there, DEET versus permethrin, you know the heavy duty chemical based um, um, bug repellents. Permethrin is a little bit more. Um, it doesn't seem to have as many effects. You know um, there is some question about DEET having some neurological effects. Um, it's a, it's a powerful chemical. Um, it eats like right through plastic. Um, so, you know, so if anything, permethrin, I would lean a little bit towards that, you know, but, but also there's a lot of these things we can do to really not need those heavy duty things. But sometimes, you know, if you're out like fishing or you're out, you know, doing, you know, out taking a nice hike through a really beautiful wetland area, like, you know, it might be worthwhile to use some of the heavier duty um, type of things. And even better when you can put those things on your clothes rather than on your actual skin. Um, and then, um, you know, making a breeze or finding a breeze to make sure, you know, that, that that's, you know, one of the best ways to sort of like reduce the bug numbers is if you, you know, even setting up a fan. So if you're going to be, you know, eating outside with friends, you know, to go ahead and set up a fan right near you actually makes a big difference in the number of bugs. Um, and they're really their ability to land on you and bite you too. Um, so, and then netted hats are great. I actually was just on a rail trail the other day and I saw a woman walking, walking her dog and she was wearing a netted hat. And I was like, that's just great, right? <laughs> like it's a really easy thing to do. And also is gonna greatly reduce the amount of bugs, bug, bug, bug repellent that you have to use and, and your bug bites too. Um, yeah, so those are some good ones. I don't, do you have any other ones that are? Uh, um, I know lemongrass is also a, a repellent and I'd like the smell of it. So that's what I end up planting around my deck. Yeah. You know, like you're saying to put a little berry, it's not the end all, but it does reduce it a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. yeah. That little barrier, like right around your, uh, yeah, that's great. Oh, lemongrass is so lovely too. Um, oh, the other thing too, actually, I didn't write on this handout was, um, uh, because I didn't really focus on ticks, but this is a good one just as we're getting in, you know, um, it's going to put them out in the fall and then again in the spring, these little um, tick tubes. So there you can make them yourself, but you can also buy them pre-made. So what they are is they basically the way you make them is you take um, like dryer lint or, a, or cotton balls um, and then you put them in, um, you, you spray them with permethrin, which is that um, bug repellent that also kills ticks actually. Um, and then you put them in a little um, uh, like a, a toilet paper tube. Um, and you put them in spaces where it looks like mice would be coming through. Um, so if they were, you know, like, like kind of my mouse traffic areas. And what the mouse will do is take that, that dryer lint or that cotton ball and use it to make their nest. And so they, um, and then so basically what they're doing and, and um, so mice are a major vector for ticks. We always think about, about deer and Lyme disease and deer, but really mice are actually one of the big vectors and one of the main ways that ticks actually, you know, get Lyme disease and transmit it. Um, and so, so I heard a statistic that a mouse can have like up to a hundred ticks on it, which seems like, really wow. cool, right. Wow. <laughs> and even just that, like, you know, the life cycle of the tick that happens, you know, they're in the mouse, you know, den. Um, so yeah. Right. I mean, I've never seen it myself on a mouse, but, um, uh, but any, but, but kind of this idea of being like, um, it's not actually harmful to mammals or to the mouse or, you know, permethrin, um, that, you know, as it doesn't seem to be as harmful to um, pl pl plant animal life. Um, and so, so it seems like a, a very good, very, very focused, very, you know, instead of spraying everywhere, it's kind of like this very focused application there. Um, so, um, so that's a good trick too. Um, so I have a, a, just a thing about ticks too, that I found out <clears throat> if you happen to get uh, a tick in you, the Uncas Health District, you can bring the tick to them and they will test it free. So just that's another, yeah, I found oh, out after the fact that absolutely. they will 
yeah. don't do that. Thanks so much for bringing that up because that is something that, um, yeah, that, that a lot of people think about like after the fact of like, oh, and um, Ledgely Health District does it too, where you can actually, you can mail them in or you can bring them in. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is great because both, both from like a personal level of like, you know, whether that tick had, had Lyme or Bavacy or something else, um, but it's, and also from a public health level, because, you know, all of this data collection is really important for looking at, you know, how, how right. many folks are carrying Lyme. Um, and, um, and tick populations are, are getting higher and higher. Um, you know, part of that is, you know, for a lot of different reasons. Um, the, uh, um, yeah, good old ticks. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And, and really, you know, nothing, nothing really, um, can take the place of a good tick check, uh, you know, really, um, checking carefully, you know, a lot of times I'm actually, it's happened to me like three or four times that I'm just doing like a regular screening physical on someone and I find a tick on them. Um, one of the things, you know, the little tiny, tiny ones are hard to find. Um, there's, there's actually a lot of controversy about those little tiny ones, whether or not they can carry Lyme disease because they're so small that, you know, they haven't had their first feed yet. Um, and so I, I listened to something like I've always heard that those ones can carry Lyme. And then I listened to a, um, it's, it was a Science Friday or something from a tick scientist about how that's actually not that they actually have to be the li- slightly bigger ones that that um, to be able to. So hopefully that's true, because those little little teeny tiny ones are the yeah. ones that are so easy to miss. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. They like, never even see them. Um, so good old poison ivy. Um <laughs> That, yeah, Ooh. yeah. Um, so uh, poison ivy is another one that's like actually growing a lot more because there's more sort of exposure. Poison ivy likes higher CO2 levels and it likes um, sort of more light exposure. So, you know, in areas that get cleared out, you can probably see this in your yard and places like that. Poison ivy is just very happy. Um, and so, um, uh, so, so in terms of poison ivy, I think one of the big things people often feel like it's, it see it that it's spreading or something. Um, the in terms of spreading, it's actually often it's either a re re um, exposure to that oil, um, you know, through like clothing. It really persists for a long time on clothing um, or any kind of object. Um, and then sometimes it's actually because like it, it sort of affects the thinner skin first, and then it moves out to the to the thicker skin. So, so a lot of times, you know, sort of like once you've you know, washed it off and everything like, and, and, you know, there's a lot of, again, this is like sort of one of those things that gets debated is how much can you spread it by, by scratching it. Um, and if there is any active oil on your skin, you can absolutely spread it by scratching it. And a lot of times people end up with it underneath their fingernails. And so it's really important as we're doing this kind of cleaning to make sure you get under your fingernails. Um, the, that oil that's in poison ivy is so incredibly, um, uh, what it, it, the duration of its of its presence. I I work I uh, lived in Northern California, and there was this um, museum where it was um, Kaduk. It was a Kaduk museum, and they had made these. There was these baskets that were woven baskets, and the the curators took the baskets out of the out of storage that were you know over a hundred years old, and uh, and they got horrendous poison ivy everywhere. No. It turned out the baskets were made of poison oak, which is like the, the West Coast oh. poison ivy. And so like literally a hundred years later that that oil was still going strong and uh, enough to give people that the rash and everything. So I, and that's an important sort of illustration of the fact that like, you know, um, tools, how important it is to like think about tools and, and clothing when we're out in any place that has poison ivy because um, it can be pretty hard to get the oils off of there. They're very, very sticky. Um, and also, you know, we can we can go back and pick up that tool that we used last year and it can still give us poison ivy. Um, so yeah. now the but the actual bubble, like if you get it and it bubbles up the blister. Yeah. Is that does that contain that, you know, the oil? It, that doesn't spread it at all. Nope, nope. That 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 bubble, that blister, is totally your own body fluid. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you know whether or not you know if it's if you know that that kind of like um, uh, you know again if you're like scratching the area if it still does have a little bit of oil on it if you scratched it and moved it that way you could do that but the oil, but the bubble inside is actually just your okay. own body fluid. Yeah. Um, the um, so, so yeah, the, the, you know, washing with, with a strong, you know, dish detergent. Um, I think you mentioned that you use um, uh, Dawn dish detergent. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. yeah totally. And, it, uh, you know, even like a, 
you know, dish detergent, you know, laundry detergent, but it, but with the caveat that like the free and clear, you know, really gentle laundry detergent, but, um, but it, but the dish detergent is great. And, um, uh, and you really want to, so you don't want to like scrub with like a, uh, washcloth because actually doing that scratching action can sort of get the oils to contact your skin even more, but the, but scrub really well with your hand like this, so that you're really moving that around to get all the oils off. Um, and just spend a long time doing it. We, I think we talked about last time about how half the reason that, you know, the tech new and all of those, you know, they give you a, a, a time frame. I think they say like scrub for three minutes and, you know, maybe that's exactly why they're so effective is because, and those are great too. I've used those for a lot of years and they're great. Um, but, uh, but really good old, you know, Dawn dish detergent can do the trick. Because- right really remove those oils. Yep. Um, there's also the, the Ivy block, um, which for a while I was seeing it around and now you can't find it anywhere. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what, what happened there, but that does work. You know, I think that, I, I don't know if it just was something that people weren't buying or if you can still get it online, but you can actually, it's like sunblock for poison Ivy. Um, so I, I think it, um, it basically makes it so that, that, that Urishal can't really contact your skin. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and, and really important, the kind of like, how do you how do you come in from working outside if you've had any kind of dealings with poison ivy? Um, one is to go directly in, don't touch anything and get your clothing into the washing machine and then do your scrub down um, pretty quickly before you touch anything. Because um, even that, that clothing, even those gloves, you know, any, anything that you have on, you can carry that oil for, for 100 years <laughs> or more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and so, um, yeah, if you're, um, and then the tools, you really want to scrub them down as well. So, um, you know, really sometimes people recommend putting them in like a, a bucket of like, um, soapy water, you know, so you put them in there, you go clean yourself up and then come back and just sort of scrub them down. Um, the, uh, there's lots of different, you know, sort of techniques out there online. If you want to look at like how to clean your tools, but, um, but really, you know, just basically getting like, you know, good make sure there's a soap involved, not just a water for that. Yeah. Easier said than done to try to like scrub down your tools. But (laughs) what we do in our household is we have like a designated, you know, clippers that are just for interacting with poison ivy. And so, uh, you know, my husband's actually not allergic to poison ivy, which I think is like actually a superhero (laughs) quality. because I but that can change that can change yeah, I know people that did have it and then yep. they ended up getting it so yep totally actually there I read a statistic and this is this is a long time ago that I read this but uh about so so I'm not sure if it would have changed or something but that most people are actually not allergic to poison ivy but they develop a, a sensitivity to it over time over exposures um and uh um and so so really that that kind of like yeah continued exposure my I when I was a kid my neighbor was burning it um burning a bunch of oh, that's horrible it, and it just like got all in my face and my eyes and ever since then I feel like I can like look at it and I get it <laughs> okay like kind of always have poison ivy yeah. yeah um but yeah they just um yeah that's a really important one too is to never burn any kind of poison ivy because of the way that those oils do you know kind of come up into the air and can get into all of the places you would least like poison ivy to be <laughs> like right yeah. Yeah. And yeah. also the fall when you don't expect it, like I would cleaning up brush and you don't realize that that vine that you're picking up is poison ivy. And that's when I've had the worst case of it because your guard is let down. I mean, we all know leaves in three, let it be. But right. You can't see the vine and you put it in your arms and you get them all up and down, you know. Absolutely. I've, t- I've done that one before too. Yeah. Because you just don't yeah exactly it's like the, there's no leaves involved you just pick it up like oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah. yeah so bad so bad so I guess yeah the way to work around that one would always be to wear you know kind of act as if there's poison ivy whenever we're doing anything um which you know yeah I try to do I mean even like dogs it can be kind of hard with dogs like they they pick it up right. and just rub against them and they're um uh yeah it's pretty pretty hard to avoid if you're <laughs> it is yeah, yeah. So that's why we have the treatments here. <laughs> um, the, uh, oh, the one that actually other thing I wanted to sort of put out there is that with the bug bites is um, I've actually, since I wrote this, um, I've been seeing a lot of people with no CM bites uh, and, and they're easy to like, you know, people are like, what is this? You know, because you're, it's actually easy to miss the bug itself because it's so small. Um, right. But yeah, they look like they look like little separate red spots. Like they almost look like mosquito bites, but they're usually like a little bit more, more of like a raised bump. Um, you know, as opposed to like a like a 
you know, um, a flat kind of a thing. They're usually like a little raised bump um, and they can be quite itchy, you know, sort of like way after the fact. Um, so, um, and the mayflies are horrible too. Yeah, totally. Know? Right. Right. The same. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so some things that I pull out, you know, I mean, I think when we, when, you know, sort of the general recommendations for, um, for, you know, poison ivy, especially is, you know, using like calamine and hydrocortisone, um, hydrocortisone, I do recommend, you know, if it's in certain circumstances, like if it's really bad and it, it you know, but I actually find these things, the things that I've listed here actually work better. Um, uh, um, in terms of reducing the itch and everything. One important thing about poison ivy is that a lot of people want to use um, antihistamines, either the, the gels or the, uh, the oral antihistamines. And that's not, that doesn't really help with poison ivy. Um, it will help if you have like a bunch of mosquito bites or if you, um, uh, because the mosquito bites, it is more of a histamine reaction, but the, but poison ivy, it's actually not a histamine reaction. It's a contact dermatitis, which is a more of like a kind of an inflammatory type reaction. Um, and so, so some people say, you know, yeah, take Benadryl so that you can sleep because the itch can keep you up at night, but, um, but the actual antihistamine is not going to really affect the itch enough, um, uh, you know, for the, for the, um, poison ivy specifically. Um, so, so some topical treatments, um, that I wanted to kind of focus on ones that you would just, people mostly will have around their house often. Um, good old chamomile tea bag is a favorite for, especially when you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel really itchy bug bites is you can just take that chamomile tea bag and kind of rub it on the bites. Um, and it actually will take it down quite a bit. Some people, you know, just sort of like say, hold it on there for a little while. Um, the other thing you can do is actually make yourself a uh, like basically bathed in chamomile tea. So you take like four, four to six tea bags and put them in the bathtub, get in there and, uh, and it has oh, okay. inflammatory anti-itch activity. Yeah. Um, it's really a really good one. Um, and then, um, witch hazel, make sure it's alcohol free because the alcohol on a, on a poison ivy rash would not be lovely. <laughs> um, but, uh, like Thayer's brand is the one that I think of that is, you know, the most, you know, sort of prevalent, um, uh, that is, doesn't have alcohol in it. And you can apply that to, uh, to a rash or to a bug bite. Um, and it really reduces the itch quite a bit. Um, so, um, uh, cucumber also has like kind of a cooling effect and it reduces the, the inflammation and the itchiness. So if you just take a little slice of cucumber, um, just like those like little so slices of cucumber over your eyes, like people used to do, um, <laughs> I still do. <laughs> um, yeah, um, that, that also really works. Sometimes, you know, you'll see in here that there's a couple of herbs that you can like put in a blender and then, you know, put either the juice or the, or the paste on there. Um, you can add cucumber to that, um, to that concoction. If you want to be, you know, have a fancy concoction, you can do like a cucumber and jewel weed combination. And then it's really good. <laughs> um, the uh, Epsom salt bath, you can actually combine that with the um, chamomile. Um, and even if you want to throw some oatmeal in there, you know, what's funny. Oatmeal is one of those ones that's like out there as being such a good one for rashes. And I, personally I've just have never seen it be all that helpful like and maybe it's because the whole like cleaning it up afterwards thing it's like a there you go. <laughs> and maybe that's maybe that's what it is but but I don't know have you ever tried oatmeal? I guess I've tried oatmeal and it really doesn't make much of a difference yeah. it really doesn't yeah. totally. that's interesting about the chamomile I want to you know try that next yeah week to see if that works yeah, yeah yeah totally yeah yeah but that but that oatmeal and less cleanup what's that <laughs> and less cleanup yeah, less totally, exactly. A lot less. Yeah, <laughs> totally, right, right. And yeah, the oatmeal, I do think probably for, um, I have seen oatmeal be more effective for like eczema and things that are, you know, more, not so much of like a, a reaction type of a thing, you know, that right. I've seen that be helpful for that, but not so much for like the poison ivies and things like that. Um, and then the, oh, the baking soda too is another one that reduces the itchiness. So you've got about a half a cup of baking soda in the bathtub. Um, and you can combine all of these, you know, like make yourself a bath concoction, or you can just do one if you have just one or, or two of those um, ingredients. Um, the uh, basil or mint, you know, those are around, you know, kind of often in the garden or around the house. Um, right. And, you know, those, you know, like the, the sort of like the, the, 
the traditional herbalist way to do this with the basil, plantain, and jewelweed is to actually chew it and just put it put it on because then if you're if you're outside already, um, some people think that's gross. Uh, so you can do it in a blender as well. Yeah. Um, so you want to put just if you're doing it in a blender, you want to put just enough water so that it'll blend. So you don't put a whole lot of water. So you know about like you know if you're if you're doing if you have like two cups of herbs, you'd probably put like three two to three tablespoons of water in there. Um, uh, so that's, um, uh, the, um, jewel weed is one is a weed that's around a lot. Um, and, and I actually recommend, I was going to put a pictures, but I actually don't want you to do it from, from memory. I want you to, as you're going out to look for the jewel weed, be looking at a picture of the jewel weed so that you make sure you get the right one. Once you see it, you'll see it everywhere. It's like, it's in a lot of places around here. Um, and you can actually take the whole plant and stick it in the blender or, you know, or chew up the leaves and, and put them right on there. Um, and, um, and, and some people, what they do is they take, they put it in the blender with a little bit of water and then they take a, like a cheesecloth and then they squeeze out the juice. Um, and then they use that as like a spray or like a, something they can apply with a cotton ball. Um, that's nice because it's a lot less messy. So, you know, like, especially like if I'm going to work or something, like I'll do more of that kind of a, a technique. Um, I mean, to tell you the truth, I do it like the easy way, which is just taking like a cotton ball and sticking it in the like the slurry, and then just you know that just collects the the juice, and I put that on. Um, so you don't have to use the whole cheesecloth situation, but um, but that's a good way to kind of get that that the component that is going to be helpful there. You and can then, actually chew it. You you could actually chew. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, totally. Right. Jewelweed. Yep, yep. It is. It's an okay one to jewelweed and plantain are fine to to kind of just like you know you don't want to like you know, necessarily you're not like swallowing it or anything, but you can chew it up and put it on there. Um, and plantain also, um, that's that, there, there's these big leaf ones. They're, they're around in a lot of places too. So right. very good one. Um, uh, actually even, I didn't put mullein, but usually there's a mullein plant around. Um, I don't know if it's as helpful for the itch, but it's very soothing. That's a great one for like soothing burns and, um, and things, you know, anything that's irritated. Um, and then, um, so the, I think jewelweed tastes pretty gross actually. Um, uh, <laughs> in, at, like I, I, I haven't chewed it in a long time, but, uh, but I think I remember it tasting pretty gross. This might be why everybody does it in the blender. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, uh, and the, and plantain, you know, plantain also, because it's such a big leaf, you know, sometimes people just take it in their hands and go like, you know, rub it like this. So you basically, you, you kind of like have to break it up a little bit, breaking up the cell walls a little bit, and then you just put the whole leaf on top and that can be lovely as well. So, um, the, um, it's, it's kind of fun. You can, it's okay to fully play with these things because you know, that, you know, just, it's going to give you some relief. And also you can kind of start to see which ones you like better and, uh, um, and also it's a neat way to get to know the plants in your yard. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, the, uh, and potato is another one, uh, hmm. where it's potato a lot actually for different kinds of, um, it's really great on like, uh, um, like if, if you have like a big beep kind of zit kind of a thing, um, uh, it, it actually is really nice. It has some salicylic acid in it, but it also has like a anti-inflammatory effect. Um, so you just take a slice of potato. Some people say you just rub it on there, but, um, but a lot of times even just like, if you can kind of like put it on there, sometimes I do a, like a, um, shred the potato and put it on a wet paper towel, um, and then fold the wet paper towel over and then just put that on there and you can cover it with like an ace bandage or something like that. Um, you can do that with any of the jewel weed or the plantain also, um, and, uh, um, and it makes a nice little, it's called a poultice. Um, so, and sometimes you can either do it like in between the paper towels, that's the nicest, cleanest way to do it. Um, but the, you can, some people really feel strongly about wanting to put it right on their skin. And so then you could do, you put it right on your skin, cover it with a wet paper towel and then cover it with an ace bandage. Um, you wouldn't want to cover it with a dry paper towel because then the paper towel is going to suck up all the stuff that you actually want to have on your skin. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Um, the, uh, um, you know, and don't put the, the ace bandage too tight, you know, around a rash or something, because that can, you know, you want to have good circulation and everything. So um, just to watch out for that. Anything else that you've found to be helpful or? Well, what are your thoughts? I know you tend not to prescribe um, homeopathic remedies, but mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on, without having to go into huge dissertation about it, but like rust pox and Absolutely. other type of things, you know, I find that rust pox yeah. has helped. Um, uh -huh. help me, but what are your thoughts on that? 
So, so I actually do. It's funny. I had written this little section on homeopathy and then I erased it. And, um, and it's interesting because I think it was like, why did I erase it actually? Um, you know, like, I think, I think there's, so there's this probably actually we've had this conversation and probably this is why is because there's this part of me, like the, my evidence-based scientific self is like, like homeopathy, like it makes no sense at all. And also, it doesn't. <laughs> it really doesn't. Amazing. The reason we say it doesn't make sense is because it's very, 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 very diluted um, to the point that it doesn't really contain, right? What, you know what it is. And uh, and so, um, but also in the in the grand scheme of like, you know, I can't like. There's one thing I definitely know about life is that there's no way to, to understand it and there that really have to stand back and be in awe of it most of the time and and right. all the time and uh and because it worked on my infant and it worked on my dog in in pretty dramatic ways and so it's like there's something to homeopathy but anyway all that to say the things that I do use for um you know our uh Roostox is a really great one um so that's for like the itchy poison ivy rash and, and it, actually you know the other thing I think this is the other reason I erased it was because with homeopathy, there's very strange um, indications. So it's like, you know, if you have a rash that feels better with warmth, you want right. rash. If you have a rash that feels better with cold, you actually want apis, which is actually like a, a bug bite or a bee bite remedy. Right. Um, and so if it's really hot and red and you want it, and it feels better with cold. And I think, oh, you know what? The other reason I, I erased it was is because I got worried that people would see that and treat, you know, if they just read the, the, uh, the handout or something that they would treat it themselves when it was actually like a cellulitis that was forming, you know, <laughs> so like, right. No, right. So, exactly. So I, think, I always get cautious about that. Um, and, and then sulfur is another one that I use for a lot of itchy, um, itchy rashes. And the, the hallmark of sulfur is if it's like pretty fine most of the day, and then you get into bed, and then it gets really bad. Um, whenever people tell me that, I think about sulfur. Um, then those, you know, those are kind of the keynotes for those in terms of the rash indication. Um, the uh, and they work really well. Like I use Rustax all the time when I have poison. Right. Um, and but it it's works. a it's a difficult concept. Also, I understand why you didn't put it in because it's not as clear cut as using basil or Epsom salt or whatever. Yeah. So. Yeah, like pretty much, I think I always put in here, like all the things that like, you know, somebody really couldn't hurt themselves with and, and homeopathy is what the nice thing about homeopathy is you can't really hurt yourself. Right. With it. You know, I do love that. But also the way that people can get hurt with it is if they were to use it instead of seeking medical attention. So it's nice to be able right. to you know, as we're talking about it, I can be really clear that like, you know, not, not in place of medical attention, if, if it meets any of these criteria that we'll talk about, about reasons to, to get more medical treatment, but, um, but it's such a great, great tool and a resource. And I've actually, I've thought about teaching classes about just like first aid homeopathy, but I think, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of like all of these reasons that I have these little, um, yeah, like these hesitations about it, you know, like I love it on this one side and like I use it for myself, my family, and I prescribe it, you know, fairly often. Um, and also there, when I, when you read the, the medical literature about it, like there's a lot of just really, um, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of sort of cases of people who have been trying to treat something with homeopathy that kind of required more medical attention and right. that's really where it gets such a bad name and it's unfortunate. Yeah. And that's a bad, that's the danger of anything of trying to just self-diagnosing. Uh, yep. You know. It's so true. You know, and even, you know, and even to like providers, you know, I, I have colleagues and, and I've, I've witnessed this in providers is like sometimes, you know, just not noticing that time where it just sort of, it went over the, went over the bump, you know, like I, I always think about how right. like, medicine is so strong and so powerful and also you know there you know there's a time and a place for pharmaceutical medicine that's just you know just over that bump where it's like oh it's getting to be where right. you know, something is is higher risk um yeah so yeah it's a capital balance on any of this too you know so. right, totally it's kind of like you know in the same, by the same token that we don't want to use you know I, you know, I wouldn't want to be using like you know homeopathy for cellulitis you know at the, by the same token right. I wouldn't want to be using, you know, a steroid for something that we could treat with plantain, you know, <laughs> like, so right. kind of right. like, 
I like, I think of it as this like spectrum and it's like really nice to be able to match the therapy, you know, the sort of strength of the therapy with the, the, the seriousness of the condition. Um, and for a lot, most of the conditions that are actually really problematic and annoying and, you know, keep us up at night and you drive us bonkers, you know, we can, they're, they're in that range of the, of the spectrum where we can actually treat them with natural medicine. So, um, so yeah, there's definitely, um, yeah, I'm so glad you brought up the homeopathy because that, I, I'm, I'm glad to get to talk about it. And also <laughs> I'm so hesitant to write it here. Um, right. Yeah. But vitamin C is another one that's actually really great. If, there, if a person tells me that they're like constantly having lots of reactions to um, mosquito bites and endoceum actually too, you know, like, because a lot of people get bitten by endoceums and, and they won't really, they won't have much of a reaction at all. But if they're having like these kind of, you know, red bumps that come up from that, um, vitamin C is really nice because it actually is a, it's a modulator of that, it, that allergic reaction. Um, so it's a, it's a nice one. Um, and it's also like a great antioxidant and it's, you know, there's a lot of good things to say about vitamin C, but I have seen it, you know, um, very directly, like, you know, before and after vitamin C that severity of the reaction to bug bites reduces quite a bit. I'll have to try that. Cause I tend to, if I get a bug bite or mosquito bite, it blows up huge totally. so I'm curious to try that because anytime I get bit it's like I get one of those um uh, mayflies it'll yeah. just swell the whole yeah. face you know totally. so yep yep absolutely yeah. okay that's, that's right. good to know and also quercetin actually for for people who have like a strong reaction to those bug bites too um quercetin is high in, in onions and blueberries but you can also there is a supplemental form of it um and so you know that that's the other one blueberries that, again blueberries, blueberries. <laughs> I, that's totally funny. You caught it because I was like, if you catch me, you're like, oh yeah, I'm talking about blueberries. <laughs> I feel like every single time, blueberries. <laughs> totally right. right. I should just name like the, the the workshop component of this whole thing. Like everything you could do with blueberries. <laughs> actually, that could be a that could be one one uh, right. module. It's totally. just uh, <laughs> right. It's like I don't know if you've gotten through a whole class without talking about blueberries. <laughs> I guess the microbiome one, I didn't talk about blueberries specifically, but pretty much everything else. It goes into everything. <laughs> right? It's true. And I have them every day. Because yep. of you, I have them all every day. I make sure nice. I have blueberries. Oh, nice. Yep. They're so yeah. good. They've been really good this last couple of weeks too. Have you noticed that? Like they've been so yes. sweet, wonderful. I've been totally digging it. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> um and then, oh, and then, so the quercetin, you know, the, the, uh, the onions, you know, people, sometimes people do this thing where they do this like slurry of like onions and um, honey that they take every day for quercetin. So that's the way to get it to food. I know it does not sound good, but actually like people say it doesn't taste as gross as it sounds. Um, I have yet to try it, obviously. Um, but uh, um, yeah, <laughs> so it's like kind of like caramelized onions, you know, like that, like this right. kind of goes there. Um, and then the antihistamines, you know, yeah, uh, they are helpful. Like if you get, if, you know, if you're in that situation where you get like a ton of mosquito bites, hopefully no one gets in that situation, but, um, you know, like a, an oral antihistamine can be helpful for that. But, but really, again, not for the, the, the poison ivy rash doesn't really, um, apply there. So I have a little list here about when to seek medical attention, um, for bug bites or rashes. And I'm just going to run through that because I wouldn't want anybody to be trying to treat something at home actually, you know, the, the, the line between, you know, sort of infection, bug bite and infection or, or poison ivy rash and infection can be kind of a hard one to see um, sometimes. And so the biggest thing, the kind of the general sort of thing that I'll say about that is that if you notice that the rash is getting better and better, then all of a sudden it gets worse um, or it's spread, it like it kind of like gets really red or hot. Um, those would all be reasons to, to sort of check in. So um, and also if it develops this like kind of yellowy crust or like any kind of little, little thing that looks like a little white bump, um, or like, mm -hmm. a, um, or if it just gets really painful to touch, um, those are all reasons that we might be thinking about there being an infection there. Cause it's really easy to get a secondary infection. We have, you know, staff and, um, is all over us and all over the world. And so, but the, but really the issue with staff is when it gets introduced into a place where it's not supposed to be and when, it, when the bug bites you or when you scratch your poison ivy rash and it's getting under that layer of protection, um, it can easily become an infection. So um, so that if a bite becomes kind of swollen and painful to touch, that's where it might be forming one an abscess, which is like that kind of deep pocket of infection. Um, the, if, if you have a poison ivy rash that extends to your eyes, your genitals, or your mouth, you definitely want to uh, um, get 
you know, medical attention for that just because that can cause damage there. Um, and, um, and so that, you know, what that probably would look like was getting some steroids or uh, something like that. So um, if it covers more than a quarter of your body, you can actually, if you do have it cover a quarter of your body, a lot of times people will actually have a poison ivy reaction, which is a really a systemic effect where they feel kind of flu-like and they can even run a fever um, over a hundred. Um, and when I had that time with a neighbor that was burning it, I did get a fever with that. And um, and that's definitely a time when it's good to get a, a, um, uh, um, a like a treatment, like a generally um, uh, steroids for that. Um, the, um, and then if the rash has that yellow crusting or like pus on it, um, that's another kind of sign that it could be turning into an infection. Um, and then, like I mentioned, if it's getting better and then it gets worse again, um, if the, if you have a bug bite and the swelling from it extends past the closest joint, that's a, that's a sign that there's some bigger reactions happening there. So for a lot of people, this especially applies to, to bee stings, um, is that for a lot of people, they, you know, over time, they get more and more reactive to the, to a bee sting. Um, and so, um, so the time, whenever, if you notice that there's <clears throat> two joints affected, or if it extends past the closest joint, um, then it's, it's time to start talking to an allergist because there's a good chance that the next one could be more of an anaphylactic type reaction. So, and take pictures, you know, if you can't get in right away, take pictures of the, of the swelling. Um, so that, uh, and of course, you know, of course, if you have any, you know, like, it, like signs and flashes can be a little bit subtle, you know, um, but they can, you know, at first, and it's really so important to just like err on the side of, of caution there. If someone says like, you know, they just recently got beat, bitten by a bee and they, they're suddenly like, whoa, I just feel a little weird. I have to sit down, you know, call the ambulance, um, actually, because, uh, um, uh, because the risk of anaphylaxis and how quickly it progresses um, is worth worth getting immediate medical attention. Um, the uh, you know nausea and vomiting can happen sometimes. A lot of times there's kind of just this general like sort of people say they kind of feel hot and tingly. They might notice that their throat is swelling. Um, they might notice they're a little bit short of breath. Um, those kinds of things, um, you know, uh, or if they just, or if they start to feel kind of like woozy and they like can't really stand up. Um, all reasons to call an ambulance right away. Don't delay, don't try to like treat it, just get the, the ambulance coming because that uh, a lot of times requires um, uh, like an epinephrine injection pretty quickly to, because um, it can progress so quickly. Is there any, not in lieu of contacting an ambulance, because I think you're right, you call that first, but is there anything that you can do in that interim while you're waiting for the ambulance to show up to yeah. kind of help yourself, you know, kind of stay alive. And absolutely. Yeah, you absolutely. Know. So the, uh, um, if a person has an EpiPen, you can do the EpiPen injection, which is, um, you know, where you take the, actually now they talk to you. Have you seen the new EpiPens? They actually tell no. you how to do it. It's pretty really? cool. But uh, they like literally talk out loud because they, they want to make it so that anybody who's near a person with an EpiPen um, can, can do it for them. So what you do is, you know, with the old ones, you just take off, there's like a safety thing, and then you just put it into their like, and you actually shouldn't do this if it does, if a person doesn't have that prescription for an EpiPen. But a lot of times what will happen in a situation, like you're at a big picnic, somebody gets a bee bite, they're having some, some kind of a reaction. Somebody else at the picnic says, hey, I have an EpiPen don't use it, call 911, you know, tell them what's going on and say, hey, we have an EpiPen, you know, and so a lot of times they can give you authorization over the phone to use it. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, there are circumstances where you wouldn't want to use it. And there's like, you know, you don't necessarily want to use an adult one on a child and the, lots of different things. Right. There. So, so ideally there's an EpiPen and that, that's something that, that can happen. Um, and then after you use the EpiPen, and actually, even if you don't have an EpiPen, getting a person into a position where their uh, legs are higher than their head, um, so, you know, on their back with their legs up, um, does two things. It sort of, you know, helps if there's like, you know, as it piercing goes into kind of like an anaphylactic shock kind of thing, keeps their circulation going. Um, but also, uh, also if they were to pass out or fall, that makes them more safe so that they're not falling onto the ground. Um, the, um, um, you know, of course, kind of like standby, like, you know, feeling for pulse and, and, you know, administer CPR if, if needed, if, if you don't feel a pulse. Um, and, and a lot of this, though, 
if if you if you're in a situation like that, you'll be calling 911, and they actually are really really excellent at talking you through these things. And around here, the response time is you know in that kind of within a couple minutes. Um, so uh, so you know usually you're just kind of it's the longest it will be the longest few minutes of your life. And, right. You know, but that's a really right. I'm so glad you asked that because like you know just having that little like more people in the community is sort of having some ideas about what to do in that situation. Um, right. Can, save lives, you know, like I've seen it happen where, um, you know, more people kind of knowing how to do CPR has made a huge difference in terms of um, uh, saving lives too. So, um, so yeah, that's the, that's kind of the main sort of thing about, you know, um, uh, anaphylaxis and, um, uh, and, you know, worst case scenario, if somebody feels like kind of woozy and it turns out like it's not anaphylaxis, like better to err on that side than than to not you know especially if they've just recently had the bug bite or something like that right uh, or eating a food that that they don't usually eat or something like that um so yeah any other questions about no <laughs> um so the bug spray too i love making bug spray uh because it's it's you know when you buy it it's actually pretty um pretty pricey the the if you it want is, to buy yeah. a premium one um yeah i i use uh because especially if you're like using it regularly it's like you go through those so quickly the uh I, I i like the badger one um i think it's just called anti-bug or something or bug spray uh they have a really good bug spray they also have this um uh um a uh, sunscreen that they have that has is includes bug spray or uh, bug repellent oils in it um and i actually find it that like lasts a little bit longer too so that's kind of nice um because the bug spray you have to reapply it like every hour to two hours for it to work which it works really well but just is kind of like a lot of reapplications um the sunscreen um uh seems to like last a little bit longer and um it works even actually the sunscreen works well really well for those mayflies too um right yeah, because those ones are really hard to get them to go away. Um, the, it has to. Yeah, seriously, right? Right. So, uh, so you can mix all these things up and you know keep them in a little like a. Um, you want it to be like either a dark brown jar. Or, you know, they have those little glass spray bottles, and they also have like the metal spray bottles. I mean, actually, one of the things I do is just take the the badger one and just refill it with a homemade one because it's a nice spray bottle too. <laughs> it fits really nicely in my purse. <laughs> it's a really good. Um, but uh, the, you know, in terms of like what your, um, uh, you know, the, you know, how you're um, mixing things up and everything, um, you know, it is nice to have the vegetable glycerin and the witch hazel. The vegetable glycerin helps it stay emulsified, but you do want to shake it before each, um, each application because emulsified just means like make it stay mixed up so that when you spray it you're getting the oils on there and they're not just rising to the surface and not coming out um and then the witch hazel is nice because it kind of like is a nice is jet nice for your skin but it also gives it like it's better than water and some people do it in water and that's totally fine they say distilled water is better um but um uh but yeah so that is, um, and sometimes people even take this formula and then dilute it with regular stills water. That's that's okay to do too, um, but this is just the one that I um, that I do. What is vegetable glycerin? Um, it's you can get it at most like health food stores. It's a um, uh, it's like it's basically like a syrupy kind of a thing, um, and it's a um, it's a emulsifier, so it keeps it mixed up, but it also stabilizes it. The other thing that you can use in place of vegetable glycerin is. Um, um, uh that the coconut oil fractionated coconut oil that is like a liquid coconut oil what what did you say what kind of coconut oil uh, fractionated okay um, yeah it's like a liquid coconut oil that that also can can kind of take the place of the glycerin um you if you look online there's like a bunch a bunch a bunch of these recipes so if it's like if you don't have these ingredients you can look and find the ones that has the ingredients that you already have access to the um the one the thing i would just say would be to always make sure that there's geranium and grapefruit in there for the ticks um so um yeah and this formula i actually didn't put lemon eucalyptus but that is that's the one that's that's even more sure proven for um for for mosquitoes i mean citronella is really good for mosquitoes but but lemon eucalyptus is even more the people who count the mosquitoes say <laughs> it's it's better <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you to those people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. So that's um uh the um oh and and I didn't say that the the uh, I don't know if I said that the sunscreen that has the the um bug repellent oils in it is the is also Badger brand as well. I think right. it's 
Um, it's just a sunscreen with bug spray in it. Yeah, or bug repellent. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love their sunscreen. I've been using it with the grandkids too. Nice, it's, nice. Yeah, so. Well, yeah, do, you, do you use the one with the, has the like orange, vanilla orange smell to it? The like, no, I haven't gotten that one. Okay, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny because I, I used that on my kid the whole time, like as he was growing up, and now it has such a strong like um associative memory that like even if I smell anything that smells like oranges or like it's basically smells like a creamsicle. And uh, yeah. and like I'm like, oh like all of the <laughs> Big, big time on the beach. I, I don't know if I want to use that with the little one because she probably would start licking her <laughs> oh, arm. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, <Very> classic. <laughs> oh well, thank you so much for being here this morning, and also a, a shout out to everyone who watches the the recordings because we do have a lot of people who uh, watch the recordings. And um, if you are watching the recording, feel free to send me any any uh, questions or comments that you might have as well. Oh, thank and you so much. You gave a lot of good information that oh. I, I had no idea about. So, oh, you know. cool. Well, actually, I'm not looking forward to using it. I hope I don't. <laughs> no, have to you're it. right. You're right. Exactly. You're like, please, me. You never need to use this. The other that's thing right. I say out loud was about your your jewel weed soap. I think that's a fantastic thing. I, the, uh, the, yeah, yeah, you can get it anywhere. Soap. I mean, yeah. uh, Cash Home Center or most of the Lowe's, Home Depot, they all carry really? the uh, the soap. Yeah, you can oh. get it anywhere. Wow. It's a little pricey. It's uh -huh. probably about well ten dollars or under a, for a bar of it, but it lasts a long time. So right, and, and really, like when I when with the poison ivy rash, it's like you like I'll do anything. You know? That's like, right. It's like whatever like, you say. Yep, exactly. Yep, <laughs> totally. I'm true. like you. I avoid it at any cost. I <laughs> identify it in my yard, and I do whatever I do to get it out of the yard. Yep. But yep, totally, you yep. can only do so much. You know, oh, right? Because it's just like it, it's it's such. I love these like weeds that are just so like vibrant. They're just like I'm. Bad. They're beautiful. <laughs> In the fall, they're gorgeous color, and then they don't look like your typical poison ivy. Then you'll see these leaves that are humongous, and they're poison ivy too. Like they come in such different forms. So it's so true, and they're so like ha like healthy and vibrant. And that's right. <laughs> oh, let's put this in an arrangement. You know, yeah, exactly right, right, right. Oh. Well, well, you have a good day. Thank you so much for covering this. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. It's good All right. Have a great day.